Great. Everybody, welcome to the weekly DCA show. Dollar cost average. As always, I've got uh, my trusty trusty friend James here from Invest Answers. James, thanks for stopping by for again for the show. I appreciate it. And then uh, we also got Ben from Into the Cryptoverse, who is back from his two-week hiatus as he goes around and, and has uh, fancy parties and things like that for the Miami Bitcoin conference, which I got to get his... Uh, his uh, foresight into what happened actually. So we'll take a look at uh, first today, I got a couple of questions for you geniuses, which is this. First of all, which comes first? New Bitcoin all-time high or a recession? Second of all, what are some signs to look for in a recession? Major crypto downturn and could crypto market uncorrelate from stocks? Also, what turns the crypto market around? Is on-chain data accurate? How can it be manipulated? And then also, what's your biggest takeaways from the Miami conference? Because James, you covered all three days. Uh, ben, you were actually there. So these are the questions I like to ask. And then as always, you can find uh, Ben's information as far as into the cryptoverse in the description of this video. And you can also check out his uh, great website, app.indocryptoverse, which I use all the time. I steal all the stuff. And then also, James, you can find him on Invest Answers, as well as his Patreon group, which I've also linked in the description below. So gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Let's get into it. Which comes first? New Bitcoin all-time high or a recession? Because I got to tell you, me personally, I think a recession is on the horizon. The question is when. So I'd like to see like a macro view and then also a TA view. So of course, let's start with the macro, the big stuff. James, let us know what we don't know. <laughs> so I get labeled the macro guy. So <laughs> it, it, it's funny because I've lived through a lot of these now over my time. And uh, one of the funniest things to mention first is Number one, for the audience to know, is a recession is always coming at some point in the future. The question is, of course, when? And uh, I think definitely looking at all the data and everything else, there's so many indicators telling us that, yes, a recession is coming probably very close to year-end 2022 or early 2023. So we have at least eight months. Um, but, you know, when you when you look at recessions, typically – you the by the time they announce that a recession is here it's already halfway over uh -huh. or about to end which is really interesting now in terms of your question which is going to come first a recession or a new all-time high for bitcoin i just look at the numbers and you know the supply crunch is there a lot of videos on supply crunch yesterday i've been talking about for a long time red alarms are going off also in the real world people now realize the pain that inflation is causing and everybody's looking for a, a hedge. Not everybody knows what that hedge is yet, but the question is, what will it be? And uh, also, mm -hmm. when we look at the different asset classes, and I monitor all the indexes, commodities, and stuff like that, since the Russian invasion, Bitcoin's up 7%. And this is when I measured this about an hour or two ago, and everything's volatile. <laughs> S&P 500's up 3.5%, gold 3%. The QQQ, which is a NASDAQ top 100 stocks, 2.3%. So from that perspective, you could argue decoupling is happening. Now, the question is, can we add 41% over the next eight months before the recession hits? I think, yes, that is very probable. Um, because last time we did it in, what, 50, 51 days, back in the beginning of October to early November. So, yes, my answer is Bitcoin, you all-time high, could hit before a recession hits. All right. Well... I got to tell you, everybody likes that answer because they want to see some action. So that would lead me to my next, or to talk to Ben here. Ben, what do you see as far as the charts? What do the charts tell us? Because I got to tell you, in different parts of YouTube, I see people calling for 20K, 12K, 9K, craziness like that. What do you see? Yeah, there's always people calling for, um, no matter how, no matter what price we go to, there'll always be someone calling for a lower price, right? Uh, um, and and James is right. There's always a recession coming. I always think about when we, when whenever we talk about recessions, like there's always like if you think back to like the pandemic when it when that first started, there was a talk about it being the next Great Depression, you know, and and lasting many years, even up to a decade. It was all over YouTube. There were talks about the housing crash of 2021, and I don't know about you guys, but the housing crash didn't mark didn't crash in 2021, as far as I can tell. Uh, um, I, I don't think we're going to see any new highs this quarter. I mean, I, I've said that. I, I think I said that a few weeks ago as well when I was when I was last on. I don't think Bitcoin's going to any new all-time highs this quarter. I think there's too much. Um, 
there, there, there are enough reasons, I think, for us to just be happy with it being at the, at the current price, I think. Um, you know, you look at a lot of a lot of uh, overarching trends like the dollar. And, and I mean, I understand the dollar is not bullish against every crypto, but mm -hmm. it's unmistakable that when the dollar is in a macro uptrend like it is right now, Bitcoin just isn't putting in new all time highs. Uh, this is something we've it, it's this is how it's always been. I mean, look, things could change, um, but that's just how it's been before. And I, I would just keep assuming that this time is not different in that sense. And that as long as that, as long as the dollar is moving higher, I don't really expect Bitcoin to put in a new all time high. Um, I mean, maybe it could do it late this year, but I don't really see it happening uh, this quarter and, and maybe not even next quarter either. So, I mean, as far as a recession, I mean, I, I guess it's hard. First of all, I guess they don't actually have to be like exclusive. Like you could have a Bitcoin high in a recession, but I, mean, I would throw everyone for, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but um Look, I, I mean, I, I think that we're likely looking at at a bit more chop here. Um, three, you know, for another three months at least, probably probably even longer um, before we're before we're looking at new all time highs. Whether that ends up getting defined as a recession or not is anyone's guess. I mean, if you think about the recession in 2020, it lasted just a few weeks <laughs> before it was technically no longer a recession. So, I mean. Obviously, with the yield curve and inversion and all that stuff, and that being a good predictor, you, I guess you would assume that something like that could happen. But I also think it's ultimately going to come down to to whether how how hawkish the Fed ends up getting, um, and and whether they actually allow for a soft landing or not, and and if the dollar stops its rampage in, um, you know, in the short to medium term, and and so it's, once once that turns back around, I'll, I'll get a lot more bullish on on Bitcoin. But in the short term, I would say no all time highs, not at least not in Q two. Yeah, I can see that. And then, well, let me let me do a quick follow up because that would lead me to your website. I love your website. I lurk around there. Of course, I watch both of you guys' channel. I also lurk also in James's Patreon just to get some information. But like this one, for, as far as like monthly returns. I mean, I always was, I always under, under suspicion that April wasn't a great month because of tax sales off and things like that. But of course I was proven wrong just by data. So April's, I mean, statistically is a pretty great month. And then May's not too bad. June, eh, July, it looks like August just kind of falls off the cliff. And then we kind of we have, I, I, September looks like an awful month. And then October, November, December is one thing kind of move around, which kind of goes that, that same stigma, which is they, they, they say on stock in the, in the traditional stock market, sell in May and go away. I might just do some of this just for June, but do you see anything else different as far as what this is showing us? Oh, Ben, you're muted. Yeah, a lot of times in the summer, the market gets kind of boring. That, I mean, that's what we saw last summer in in 2021. Um, but there are occasional summers where it can be interesting. If you think back to the DeFi summer of 2020, that that sort of preceded the 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 Bitcoin pump. That was when a lot of the a lot of all the DeFi protocols were were you know freaking out and, and sort of front running whatever Bitcoin was about to do. Um, yeah, on average. And actually, if you go to the top, you can actually make it so that it, it excludes like the first few years because there, there's a lot of like um, extremes. Like where if you see where the out average calculations start, change that to like 2014 or something. Like once we actually have like a little bit more reasonable data, um, it still tells a, a fairly similar story. But it, it tells the, the story, namely that it tells is like September sucks. Usually I mean, it always sucks. It, I mean, it last five years in a row. Right. It, it just it sucks. Um, and that, you know, the, the, the other months are, they, they tend to be, I mean, most months tend to be green on average. If you just look at the bottom, like the average return does in fact tend to be, tend to be good. Um, but you can see March doesn't tend to be that great, but then this March was, was fine. So I was wondering, cause I was talking about that on my channel, I was seeing maybe we're front running <laughs> what's actually going to happen in March. Um, what I thought was interesting about April and, and it's interesting where we currently are is that the worst performance that bitcoin has ever given in april has been like negative three percent like ever in april and mm. right now we're sitting at like negative 11 percent. so who knows maybe maybe i mean the month's not over right i mean we could still we could still go back up and and not have it be so bad but um, i do look at some of these seasonality type things and um just sort of try to try to chase the trend and or try to understand what the trend is going to be like for instance anytime we have a red january it typically is followed by double digit gain february and we okay. saw that happen again this year as well. Um, March tends to be red. This March was green. So again, it's not a, it's not a, it's not going to go, you know, bad 100. But 
it is something I think it's something to follow. And there is some seasonality there with Bitcoin and, and it, it just doesn't typically do a whole lot um, in the summertime. Yeah, gotcha. So then and then before I move on to the next one, James, I got to ask you, what are some indicators we need to look at as far as like for recession? What are we, some factors we should see? I mean, as you said, it's a little bit of, of hindsight because it's already here. But what should we be looking at as far as to say this is a recession for sure? I mean, I, I mean, we all kind of feel it already, don't we? But indicators. Yeah. Again, for people to understand what a recession technically is, it's two consecutive quarters of negative growth. So if they say, for example, growth last quarter is 3% and it goes down to 2.9% or 2.6% or whatever, and that happens twice in a row, then the next quarter it goes down to 2.4%. That's considered a recession, just no growth. So it's not altogether catastrophic. Now, as I mentioned before, by the time the Bureau has figured out the start of the recession is here and they publish it, it's close to the end. That's just history speaking. And governments and politicians know in order to stay in power, they need to avert this situation, a recession, because that's deadly for a political career um, or a party or whatever. So we know they'll do whatever they can to engineer a soft landing up until the elections in November. So that's a given. Now, the global mm -hmm. economy, though, is, I mean, Talk about all of the setbacks. I, I can't even begin. You've got yeah. uh, a Russia invasion of Ukraine. You got the C-19 shutdowns again in China, hardcore. You got energy commodity, food inflation, wage inflation. Wage inflation is ridiculous. For the last 12 consecutive months, wages have failed to keep even close pace with rising prices. So the American worker and probably workers all around the world are getting hammered right now with inflation. It's the silent thief. And regarding the yield curve, well, that flat flip back to normal, the 10 to year. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too concerned. But again, that can be engineered to, to behave in a certain way by buying and selling of bonds by the, the Fed. So don't, don't pay too much attention to that. There is one interesting one. It's an old one, but a good one. And that's called the BDI, which is the Baltic Dry Index. Hmm. And that's a very good leading indicator for global growth. And that's fallen 83% since, I think, 2019 highs. And last time it fell 90% in this window, it preceded the 2008 uh, Great Recession. So, and just for those that don't know, the Baltic Dry Index is the average prices paid for transport of dry bulk materials across 20 routes. So it's it's a very small, unique indicator, sure. but it shows you economic activity very clearly. Gents, I got to tell you, answering these questions does not give me much, much confidence in the actual market. It just sounds like the data is not, uh, not on our side. So I guess this will lead me to my next question. Well, actually, it's going to roll into the third one. Can we, un can we uncorrelate a little bit from stocks? I know, James, you don't think that we're, we're heavily correlated to NASDAQ. I personally think that every time I do a video... I can kind of see it, even though it's at 0 0.56 correlation, I understand. But it just seems like NASDAQ, uh, crypto market, once it's up, we're also up. Once it's down, it's also down. Can we totally uncorrelate and be in an inversion? And then also, what can turn this crypto market around? Because let's be honest, it's not looking too great right now. So what do we got? And James, I want to start with you again, because you even told me, Bitcoin strong. Let's hear it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you talk about decoupling and uncorrelation between the QQQ. I mean... I spent a lot of time Oops. analyzing those correlations, but you can see just since the invasion, Bitcoin's up 7%, QQQ is up 2.3%. So you could argue that's already decoupling. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, what can turn this around? I think you can't look at indices in isolation mm -hmm. because, uh, again, going back to history, sometimes hikes, uh, sometimes stock markets actually perform really well during rounds of multiple hikes. We saw that in the 80s. We saw that in 2010 to 2020 hike cycle. I think it's 2015 to 2018. So that's possible. And remember, these are subtle hikes. If the Fed goes crazy and jacks rates completely, they are going to destroy GDP growth because the servicing of the debt goes parabolic every time they go from a very low rate up a fraction. So I did a whole video on that a while back. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's a direct correlation. So they can't jack the rates too much, even though they say, yeah, they might do six or five or seven hikes yeah. during 2022. Um, I think the real issue is, you know, the recession is looming like we discussed. The hikes are coming. Uh, the war is ongoing. C-19 is there. It's going to be a cruddy, choppy, bumpy 
buckle in year. <laughs> we all knew that. We knew that in 2021. But yeah. we didn't expect certain things to happen that did. Yeah. Like I gave the Ukraine invasion a 35% probability in December. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was off on that one. But folks are stacking regardless. And if we're talking stocks, there are recession-proof stocks out there. And um, But it's going to be a complicated year for sure. Now, the, 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 what makes me very bullish, though, and I don't want to be a hopium slinger, but the bond market's toast, fiat is toast. Everybody's examining their reserve strategy, treasury strategy. Everybody needs a, a, an inflation against inf- or a hedge against inflation. So I think it's still not the end of the world. And again, even with the crappy market conditions, Bitcoin has been unbelievably resilient, hovering around that 39 to 40K, 41K mark, which has blown me away. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I would totally agree with you about, you know, the uh, risks and where, where are people going to go? Can you go into stocks? Not really. Can you go into to real estate? Not so much. Things are going up. Can you go into different macro events? No. So like if you talk about crypto and digital assets, I think a lot of different big players and institutions could get in if we had the, the clarity as far as regulation. So Ben, bring it home for us, because if we're taking a look at what can turn the crypto market around, what do we look for that we could say, OK, yes, this is where we're looking at to go up into a different way? I think a lot of times, <laughs> as simple as it is, I think the answer is, is, is time. Like from a quantitative perspective, like the you can look at like what the fair value is and everything, like all that sort of stuff. And like, yeah, here's the dart, right? Here's the fair value of the asset class is around 1.6 trillion. According to this chart, again, this is just a quantitative model. It's not based on what I think it should be or what you think or what we're attached to. It just says, you know, the fair value of the asset class is 1.6 trillion. But... Yeah, like if you scroll out, the, the fair value out in, say, middle of 2023 is going to be three to four trillion. And, and out in 2024, it'll be even higher. So the, the, the idea or the, the, the general, I think, idea here is that we just need a bit, a bit more time. And the fair value of, of Bitcoin um, fit to all data is, is 36K right now. But again, these are, these are monotonically increasing functions, right? They don't go down. They just go up because the idea is that it trends higher with time. And so I think... We, we just need we need time um, to get there. I, I mean, I think like the next three, three months, six months, we still have some some choppy times ahead. But I, I do think we'll come out the other side. I mean, so I really I, I mean, the argument is time in a more in a more concrete thing. I think we need to see everything shift back to risk on. And we're not risk on right now with the Nasdaq and the S&P, you know, mm-hmm. struggling to to even get back to their prior highs. It's not a risk on time. And again, with the dollar in a macro uptrend, it doesn't leave really a lot of room for risk on assets right uh, at the current time. So um, maybe maybe one of the things that would be we could see things turn around is if if inflation, I'm not talking about whatever the unofficial numbers are, because we could debate that all day. But whatever the official numbers are that are coming out, you know, it's still going higher. And so I think because they're still going higher, everyone sort of assumes, well, the Fed's going to keep being really hawkish. Right. Because that's their sort of mandate to, is to get inflation under control. And so, therefore, if they're going to be hawkish, people are still sort of risk off. And if we're risk off, the dollar is going to keep rallying, uh, is, my, is my thinking on this. So then what I'm looking for is I'm looking for inflation to sort of have like an inflection point or something where not necessarily it's not going to get to the 2% target anytime soon. But if it could, ag- if it, if it could at least, you know, stop going up so quickly and maybe come, start to come back down a little bit. Then, then perhaps people would would be a little bit more risk on. So that's something that's something a little bit more concrete that I'm I'm tracking. Excellent statement. Yeah. So me personally, I see uh, I see some pain, just like both of you guys do. But in the long term, I see some real positivity. Just the question is how much. And I think that uh, that chart we just showed from Ben's website really just lays it out. Time in the market is more important than timing. And let's switch gears just a little bit. Last two questions. On chain data. Different issues come about. And as far as like on-chain data, how accurate is it and can it be manipulated? And there's a lot of different things that are going on. And I've even heard these stories where, you know, whales or uh, institutional investors or, or people with a lot of different Bitcoin or crypto, they can just break it up into a bunch of different wallets and then spread it all out. I personally don't think that they all do that because I think that uh, some of them don't really even understand the whole process. But the question is sound. Is on-chain data accurate and how can it be manipulated? Ben, I'll start with you just to see where you're at. If you could actually go back to the website and maybe go to the on-chain section, um, I could we could talk about a couple things. But I mean, it, in general, it it can be manipulated. So yeah, if you go to the on-chain charts, go to supply, uh, scroll up a little bit, and go to supply. 
Uh, yeah, at the top, top left. Supply. Yeah, and then go to like the R hodl waves. Yeah, look at something like that. The R hodl waves, okay. not the ratio, the actual, the one above that one, the waves. And then if you click on LTH at the bottom, it'll do long term holders. Uh huh. Yeah, so just click on under under the chart you you should see the yeah you can just click on lth and it'll so you know th these are the interesting charts because look i mean anyone can manipulate the on-chain data I, I can i can say send i could take like say one bitcoin and and send a tenth of a bitcoin to 10 different addresses and it's going to theoretically show up in this chart or you know show up on some of these charts so yeah i mean it can be manipulated but even though it can be manipulated there are still fairly clear trends right what do you see here with the long-term holders when 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 the percentage of the supply and this by the way this is weighted by the realized price of bitcoin so it's different than just the hodl waves it's weighted by the realized price what you notice is that when it gets elevated like this that's where the tourists are gone okay so the, the tourists mm -hmm. are gone right now um every time we have a bubble it, it brings in a lot of new retail investors and a certain percentage of those investors actually have the conviction to stick around because they believe in the asset class Okay. Most of them don't, right? Most people don't. They leave. They're tourists. They come back, a few, you know, whenever later that it, that it goes parabolic again. But you can look at charts like this and say, you know what? Even if you try to manipulate the data, it still shows the same trend. Like when we're when the market is boring, that's when people are the long term investors are accumulating. And 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 do this. Click on the short term and click on short term holders. The STH. You'll see the exact opposite. The, the long term stuff peaks during accumulation phases, where do the short-term peaks? They, they peak at the peak, right? Because that's where, <laughs> that's where you know, the, 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 the retail investors, that's where they have interest. They just come in for a quick buck or they probably are more likely losing money because they, you know, they, they're buying the bags from the people that are buying you know, during, during the long bear markets or reaccumulation phases. So yeah, it, it, the short answer is it can be manipulated, but I do think there's a lot of, a lot of charts that, that show there are really clear trends in the market, right? There are clear trends in the market. And I think one thing that, that people should do a better job of with on-chain stuff is sometimes we like to use things that sound good to say why the price should go up. But in reality, when long-term investors are accumulating, when you see that going up, it means that the price isn't necessarily going up, right? It's once the long-term investors, once that percentage starts going down, that's what you want to see because that means the price is going up. So a lot of times people sort of, have it reversed and how they think of it. So right now is sort of the time where you have the tourists that are gone, you have the long-term investors accumulating, and it's pretty clear by, by some of these charts. And again, these are the types of investors that are going to buy Bitcoin at 40K, at 30K, at 50K, even if it goes to 20K. is The same investors are probably going to stick around for it at this point. Um, and then the short-term investors will come back again whenever we go to six figures. Shoo. Excellent. James, same thing here. Can it be manipulated? And how confusing is it? Well, uh, take, take a step back in time. I, I was attracted to Bitcoin nearly six years ago because of its transparency. No more behind closed doors, watching the action play out on chain live is mesmerizing. And that is my fascination. And of course, the hard cap, very low inflation or deflation. But apparently, what we've noticed is in a very high inflationary environment, everybody wants to have a counter inflationary narrative. And, and you triggered me to talk about Akala yesterday because you mentioned it and everybody's showcasing stuff. And so it depends on the source. So we are actually comparing like a whole bunch of on-chain data sources to each other. And they all slice and slice stuff a little bit differently. So the problem that retail investors have is they can read an article, they can look at a title or a Twitter, a tweet or something on some gra graphic. And as Ben correctly said, you can actually tweak on-chain data to fit your narrative. You mm -hmm. can find something and make it seem bullish or not. But the problem is for the retail investors, there's a whole bunch of gobbledygook out there. People mm -hmm. are conflating items, hiding papers that were previously published. Tokenomics is all over the place. Uh, stuff can be hidden, obfuscated. So they got token unlock dates and foundation unlocks and VC unlocks and staking mm -hmm. rewards and minting rewards and max supplies and cap right. supplies and all this type of stuff. And it confuses the hell out of people. So you can just jump on one key term, play with it, tweak it to your narrative and showcase it. And the typical retail investor is like, 
Ooh, that sounds really good. Like you see, you see things where oh, something recently says, "Oh yeah, this chain had eighty thousand percent increase in TVL." But if you go from one million to eighty million or whatever, it, it's a nothing burger. But you know, everybody gets so excited about this. So everybody needs to, as you used to say, Rob, zoom out, look at all of the data from multiple sources, build a model, and make your own decision. Yeah, so. and this is this is one of those things, like just what you said is when I got into crypto in 2017, and Ben can attest to this. Uh, back in those days, everything was going to the moon, and it was just the greatest thing of all time. And every YouTuber and Twitter star out there, it was all the same hype, and whatever else. And it it really pisses you off when things don't go that way, and they don't tell you the truth of what really is going on. That's why I like to listen to both of your shows because there is the positives and the negatives. So I just want to say thanks for that. And then lastly, get to our last question. The Miami conference, what was your biggest takeaway? So Ben, I want, to I want to start with you because you were there. You were actually there. You got to meet a bunch of people. So when you were there, like, what was the vibe like? What, what did you see? What are some of the things that you just really can't just get uh, from, from video? I think one of the biggest takeaways that I wasn't really expecting, I don't know why I wasn't expecting it, but there's just so many people building in the space, like a lot more mm -hmm. people than I thought. And there's so many, like, there's so many companies like I've never even heard of before, you know, and, and there's, I mean, what it shows me is that there's a lot of people that have the conviction in the space, right? They, they, they think it's going to ultimately prevail. It is the future. Otherwise they wouldn't be building in it, right? If they, if right. they didn't think that. So I, I met a lot of people, a lot of mining companies, actually, like a ton of mining companies. I had no <laughs> idea there were this many people. I mean, I, I should have, right. But there were just so many mining companies <laughs> and. Um, and, and, you know, some of them were, were even kind of honest about, about some of the stuff because some of them are like, look, we're going to be competitive until the next having. And then we're kind of like, <laughs> we're not really competitive anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. just because of like, you know, the, like kind of the, the circumstances they find themselves in and, and some of the, you know, the technology, like the Intel chips and whatever that are going to be coming out. So, um, I, I found like the, mm -hmm. the overall mood fairly, fairly vibrant and a lot of people building. And I was kind of surprised that. I didn't go in 2021, but I, I know that there was like twice as many people here this year, even though, you know, the price has been relatively flat for the last year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it makes sense that after a parabolic rally, you would have a lot of people like in 2021, but price has been flat for the last year and we doubled, I think they doubled the amount of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I thought that was really cool. And, and there were some really, I, there were some really like unique businesses too. Like there was one in one, one, uh, pitch I went to in in um, in one of the rooms, and this guy from like Kentucky was talking about they basically they basically because we we're talking about like carbon and stuff um, in some previous videos, like the emissions and stuff. They they basically import trash to to Kentucky, and then they use a process called gasification, hmm. and then they 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 mine Bitcoin. Um, and and it's it's a fairly green a green thing and um they were looking for you know for for fundraising that sort of stuff to to um you know, to basically help them scale quickly you know because it's one of those things where it's like all they really need is is trash <laughs> um, <laughs> there's plenty uh, of that yeah and and then of course the infrastructure uh, but yeah there were just like a lot of really a lot of really interesting companies um. And there were there were so many like satellite events too that I, I guess I wasn't really ex like I, I didn't know this is my first conference like my first Bitcoin conference that I've been to. There's so many satellite events um, based around like every every like sector that you can even imagine, even outside of Bitcoin, like other other altcoin stuff, like everything. There's just so many different um, um, uh, satellite events, and it, I mean it really does show me that that crypto is slowly and slowly getting its like fingertips into every little part of society, you know? And, and then I, I look around today and there's like, there's like five conferences every month that someone's like, you know, inviting, inviting me to, you know, say, Hey, you should go to this one or this one or that one. I'm just like, well, there's so, so much stuff. So yeah, I think part of it is just realizing how, how big the community is and how, you know, the conviction that people must feel if they're all willing to, if 25,000 people are all willing to descend on Miami for a week, just to, you know, to learn about Bitcoin, to talk about it and to try to build the community. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it makes me feel like it, it gives me a little sense of calm because if, if we would have really regressed and there wasn't a lot of people over there, I'd be like, I don't know, because what you really need is a community. We can see that in the crypto products that are out there. The more that people come about and the more they're, they're passionate about, it, I think the more things grow. So we'll figure all the rest of this stuff 
Uh, we'll just give us some time. And then James, you covered, I think all three days. And I even, I even sent you a message. Thanks, man. Cause I can't watch all this stuff. So what did you get out of the whole thing? That's so funny. You, you talk about mining. You got to mine 24 hours worth of coverage to get <laughs> 73 nuggets. That's what I pulled out. I think it was about 73 because I counted them. But the yeah. top the top ones that stuck in my head was uh, Michael Saylor. Obviously, I'm a big fan. And he said, everybody's questioning the treasury strategy. That was a big takeaway. Mm -hmm. There was a guy, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it was Brian. No, um, uh, VJ, uh, I can't remember his name, um, but he said 2% inflation means 50% destruction of a generation's oh, yeah. net worth. I saw that. And I said, have you tried 21%? That's complete <laughs> obliteration in like 15 years. So just those little numbers, those little nuggets stuck in my mind. Then you have Lynn Alden, uh, who is brilliant. She said, emerging markets cannot access good money. And, you know, when you look at the key big reserve currencies in the world, mm -hmm. they make up three or four countries. That's it. The rest of the world is stuffed. They need Bitcoin. And I thought that was very poignant and very true. Um, then Kaiser, Max Kaiser, who's a funny fellow, he said, Bitcoin is the God particle. So I used to read a lot of stuff a long time ago about the God particle, but I've never heard yeah. it framed that way. I thought it was funny. Um, and then the, the, one of the big things was the Square and Tesla news during the conference, not at the conference, about uh, collaborating and mining on solar. I thought that was the biggest news of the whole conference. Not yeah. At the conference. Then... Um, there was another few other nuggets about the fact that Bitcoin will replace all commodities that have mm. been given a monetary premium, like gold, S&P index, et cetera. Um, Brian Estes is another guy. I do remember his name. He said we'll be at 90% adoption by 2029. Globally, we're at 1% now. So just to think about what 90% of Bitcoin adoption means, when 2029 is not that far away. That's basically... Mm -hmm you know, a one year more than the time I've been in Bitcoin. And then another guy said, I think it may have been the same hmm. fellow, but the feds and the DOJ own one and a half percent of all Bitcoin. That was an eye opener for me. Hmm. Uh, another one is we know it, but when you hear these words like Bitcoin will be the scarcest asset on earth two years from now. So if you know anything about stock to flow, that is a staggering statement. Um, there was also... I, mm. I just I did numbers. I was listening to everybody's price predictions and models and stock flow and everything else. And I put together all the top 10 or 11 pricing models for Bitcoin. And yeah. I took an average of them all. And the average came to $2.3 million by 2030. I thought that was interesting. That's and not bad. Best, I'll take that. Yeah. And the best was uh, Peter Thiel, who I'm a big fan of. Uh, met him a couple of times in Silicon Valley. But super, super intelligent, interesting guy. And he broke it all down. He broke down, you know, what is money, gold, Bitcoin, Ethereum, value and velocity, bringing it, it you bring light to the ESG FUD and comparing ESG to CCP, all that stuff I thought was mesmerizing as well. So they're the big, you know, 73 takeaways, they'd probably be the top eight or 10 or 12 or how many I rattled off, but they're the ones that are top of my mind right now. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it's it's fascinating because, like, again, when in doubt, zoom out. Right now, the markets don't look so great. And then, the last thing I will say is this: necessity is the mother of all invention. So, if we're taking a look at uh, Bitcoin mining and we've got Tesla working with Block, how much farther can they push that technology? Because right now, as far as like uh, photovoltaic cells and uh, for solar panels, you can only get so much percentage of of what you actually can can grab and then put into a battery. Maybe they can actually improve that technology to where it's actually viable. And then we see that in electricity globally. Just a thought. Anyhow, so those were great takes. I appreciate it, gentlemen. Let's go over a quick questions and get out of here and see what we got. So as you were talking, I kind of take a look. I peruse the comments and here's some, uh, here's some good ones. First up, Ricardo Alberto Sanchez. Hi, me. I wonder if Ben, Rob, and James consider that the world is over-regulating, taxing the cryptoverse. Every week a new tax or regulation is out. But zero, and I repeat, zero clarification of the status of crypto. And I'll just take this one real quick. It's amazing to me that politicians and the governments can come out and go, we're not going to say this is legal tender. We're not going to say it's right. We're not going to give you clarification, but we're going to tax the living tar out of you. India is up to 30%. A couple of their parliament members wants to go to 50%. The EU almost completely banned proof of work. And then uh, the things that are going on just, just globally as far as the, the regulations, the SEC coming down, there's a big problem. There is 
a massive problem coming about. And I think that what could turn this whole crypto market around, because we are asking these things, let's just say, for instance, the U.S. government comes out and goes, we're going to give you guys clarity. SEC is so stubborn, I don't think they're going to do that. But if they just say, hey, crypto, this types of, these types of crypto are a commodity. This is property. This is a currency. And this is a security. All you got to do is just give us that. So institutions kind of can move that, that in. I think it'll be a great thing. So what do you think about politicians and regulations screwing up too bad and then making it uh, a problem? James, since you're up, I'll let you go. Oh, um, I think a little bit of regulation is definitely needed. There's so many scams out there, so many slow motion rug pulls, so much Ponzinomics. It's just uh, horrifying. Gary Gensler has has 200 years of work ahead of him. If you look at the time it takes to settle the XRP stuff, <laughs> multiply that by, what, 18,000 cryptos? <laughs> It'll never get to the end of it. So, uh, yeah, some, some hard regulation is definitely required, and that will bring in more money, which will inflate all prices. It's a good thing. Without regulation, there is no space. So that's my take on that. In terms of taxing the tar out of it, I know India has been all over the place for the last year and a half, up, down, left, right, every couple of weeks. So, you know, I think it's, it's an issue. And then you've got state laws in the U.S. trying to forward some bills that are just ridiculous. So we'll see what happens, but a little bit of regulation will be okay. And I think we have a new generation of politicians coming through, which see the light. So fingers crossed. I can see that. And then uh, that would lead me to Ben. And Ben, before I, I have you ask the question, uh, TND Tesla says, Ben has amazing graphs. He does have amazing graphs. So go ahead and take a look in the description. You can find all those graphs, app.indecryptoverse. So Ben, the question is, what do you think? Regulation, is it necessary? Yeah. And, and how's this? Yeah. Work? Yeah. I mean, I think it is necessary because I see so many, a lot of people are, a lot of, I think a lot of the larger money is still somewhat skeptical of some of the, some of them of like, well, what's going to happen when there is regulation? What are they going to be deemed as? How do they, how do they navigate that? And if you think about it from like a, from the perspective of, of the fact that, you know, the, from the, because Bitcoin's market cap continues to sort of, be, you know, sort of go higher and higher and higher with time. We need we need big money to you know to keep coming in to su to support our growth, and I, I feel like in order to really get that big money, you need a bit more clarification on the asset class. We can't you know be fine one day and then two weeks later we're all of a sudden worried about you know mm -hmm. you know the United States basically making it so that every proof of stake protocol out there is untenable for people because you're now all of a sudden required to KYC all of your delegators or something like we don't know we don't know the answers to all this stuff right now and. And I do think we need some type of, you know, clarification on on how are they going to be treated? You know, um, you don't have to constantly worry about this stuff, you know, with, with some other stuff. So it would be nice to get to get some type of regulation. I just hope they get it right, because certainly they could do something <laughs> wrong. Like, I mean, imagine if they had gotten it wrong with the Internet. I mean, that would have set us back so much, you know, but they didn't. They, I don't I, I think they did a, a fairly decent job. I mean, I was I was a kid back then, so I wasn't really following it that closely, except maybe like instant messaging my friends. Um, but uh, yeah, I think regulation is is probably a, a good thing for you know for a lot of the larger money to come into the space. But it's funny because it also sort of goes it sort of goes against a lot of what people want, and that's just like you know keep everything super unregulated. And it's also funny too because I, I, there's even been some like big figures that say they they don't want regulation and then the minute they get rugged oh now they want regulation you know <laughs> so it's like what do you want do you want it to be unregulated and and you know like the wild west or do you or, or do you you know do you want do you want more regulation i do think some regulation would be good so that we we don't have to constantly live in fear of of what what are they going to do yeah exactly and then just i mean to to, to speak to your point yes everybody wants right no one wants regulation until they need it right the same thing with like health insurance so it's the same thing with the internet. Back in the day, and Law 230 came about, they said, hey, we're not going to hold the internet provider or the website uh, liable for something that is said on your website, which opened everything up because they say, well, we're not going to be responsible. It's the same thing for these institutions. If they don't have this regulation and clarity. It all goes out the window. So that part concludes that question. Last one, or a couple last ones. I just want to get your guys' opinion on this one, Celsius. And there was an AMA that just came about and they didn't say anything. I didn't watch the AMA, so I cannot uh, verify this, but it would seem to me that, that Celsius would talk about the fact that 
In America, in the U.S., this only uh, is uh, viable for U.S. non-accredited investors. You will not receive any yield on any tokens that you put in Celsius past the day, April 15th. So if you're not accredited, meaning you don't make $200,000, $300,000 per year, or you don't have $5 million as, as far as your corporation, uh, you are an, a what, what they deem fit as a non-accredited investor, meaning you can go gamble your life savings away in a casino. That's fine. But don't you dare put it into a new technology because you're not smart enough. That's essentially what they're saying. I, I, I hate to say it like that, but it's really what it is. So James... What do you think about what's going on? Did they get it right? And where do you think Celsius goes from here? Well, very quickly, there's a lot of stuff going on behind closed doors with the SEC that we don't know about. But obviously, sure. it's all about protecting the investors. And accredited investors can risk all the money they want. SEC don't, don't care about those guys. So they're sorry about that background noise, irrigation system. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. Ben, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, yeah, there's, there's probably a lot of stuff going behind the scenes that we don't really know about. Um, and, and so I'm, yeah, my true. guess is that it's not, my guess is it's not necessarily Celsius, something Celsius wants to do, you no. know, but they're probably feeling compelled to do uh, because of, of the garbage regulations that they have to deal with the united states i mean like look at it's not just celsius though like even a lot of larger platforms they split up into like think about like binance now they have binance and they have binance us <laughs> yeah. um there, there's just there, there's just so much stuff and, and you know if you're one of these large you know companies that operate worldwide you have basically everyone else and then you have the united states that has like all these ridiculous things that you have to jump through all these hurdles with so I don't really blame Celsius for it. I, I think that no. it's not something they can control. Um, they're just trying to trying to continue operating as a business and in 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 like with in line in the line of the law. Exactly. Um, so exactly. yeah, we just have to we just have to keep hoping that that the government can can figure things out before literally every single cryptocurrency company goes overseas. Exactly. What what people also don't realize is this kind of ties into the previous question about regulation mm -hmm. is if the entities don't follow the law closely or even go beyond what the law is requiring, they could get shut down entirely. And believe me, what they're being forced to do is not what Alex wants. He wants to give everybody their yield. Right now, he's got a little loophole yeah. to just, just to support accredited investors. So everybody, don't blame Celsius. Don't blame Nexo. Don't blame BlockFi. Don't blame Coinbase for wanting to set up a yield product and having to shut that down out of the gate. It's not them. It's the regulators and the regulators still trying to get wrap their heads around this whole space. Yeah. Nobody. No, they don't want to do that. And that's just that's just really how it goes. Do they No. Celsius, BlockFi, all those guys, they don't want to go and tussle with the SEC and go through an expensive litigation to what could uh, be nothing. So, of course, they have to do that. And then this will lead me to my last one. Just a general question. If Bitcoin goes down by 50 to 60%, do all the alt altcoins go down by 80, 90% or more? James, what do you got? Well, if Bitcoin goes to 20K, um, it's theoretically possible, but it's a 1% chance of it happening, maybe 2% uh, by my math, considering who is holding it, who is buying it, who is aggregating it. Just imagine for a second, you've got, you're a big money center bank or you're a big hedge fund or whatever else. And you see this thing going down near 30 grand, you're going to swoop in. Like we saw this happening uh, where we thought we were going to 32K at the invasion, we only hit 35K. Yeah. And people are there waiting in the wings to grab this stuff up cheap. So we're not going down to 20K. So forget all the stuff you watch on videos on YouTube and all this fear mongering. Ignore that. But if Bitcoin does fall by 60%, yes, alts could fall by 80 to 90%. You're dead right there. All but right. there are quality alts that are actually deviating from alts in the space too. Those that have very good value propositions out there. So they, they will survive and fare a lot better. And the correlation between, say, Bitcoin and Ethereum right now is 0 0.91. That means if Bitcoin mm -hmm. falls 50%, Ethereum will fall maybe 55%. So it's very tight. I can deal with that. Seems like a safe one. And Ben, last question. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, if Bitcoin falls 50%, alts are, are going to be, I mean, they, they won't, I don't think many, I mean, the, the, the main alts are, are probably not going to fall 90% from where they currently are, or, you know, but they might fall 80, 90% from whatever their highs were back in, 
you know, whenever they, they put in their highs. Um, yeah, if you look at and the reason that is, is because they alts do well until until Bitcoin sort of loses confidence. So like if, if Bitcoin were to go to 20K, then like, you know, that's sort of like the, the bubble is being fully deflated. You know, like the 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 it, like I, I sort of described it earlier, like if you think about like a material under under some type of tension and and the asset class like has this tension right now. And if, if that is released, then altcoins are the ones that suffer the most. And that's why being Bitcoin heavy just to protect your downside isn't isn't necessarily a bad thing. So yeah, I mean, if Bitcoin drops fifty percent, you could easily see you could easily see altcoins drop more than Bitcoin. You would likely see altcoins drop more than Bitcoin. So I, I think the question is, I mean, if you want to if you want to like a a practical thing to look for, um, because the dominance was also around the same you know around the same level back in twenty eighteen. What I would be looking for right now to to be with regards to altcoins is if Bitcoin puts in a lower low. So technically speaking, Bitcoin's been putting in higher lows, right? I mean, being technically correct is the best way to be correct, right? So it's been putting in higher lows. And and so altcoins are still relatively strong so far, right? I mean, they're they're not, I mean, some are even putting in new all-time highs, right? Luna just put in a new all-time high, you know, yeah. fairly recently. So but I think the the thing to look for to, to, that would be a warning sign is if Bitcoin puts in a lower low. So if you think like it it did like 33k and then 34k, if we go back down to like 31k, I imagine some alt Bitcoin valuations would would bleed. I'm not saying they necessarily need to go down 90, percent but that would be that would be something to to, to look for um, in terms of the strength of the altcoin market. Because yeah, if Bitcoin drops 50 percent and goes to 20k, then you you would expect alt, alt Bitcoin pairs to bleed. You would also expect alt Ether pairs. To, to bleed as well. And you would also expect Ether Bitcoin to drop too. Hey. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. So gentlemen, again, thanks so much for the show. We appreciate it. And also, uh, just so everybody knows, if we're uh, taking a look, if you're looking for uh, Ben's channel, which I don't know if it wouldn't be spreading already, or James's channel, right there underneath the, the description. There's James' channel, Ben's channel. James is uh, Patreon and Ben's uh into the Cryptoverse site where you can take a look at all those awesome charts. So that is it for today. So gents, thanks so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next one. I appreciate you guys. Thank Love you, you. the audience as well.